a wonderful welcome to Ask the Pros. And Ask the Pros series is powered by the Coffee Technicians Program. Interested in developing your skills as a coffee technician? Check out the Coffee Technicians Program, an education program for new and experienced technicians alike. Available at the foundation, intermediate, and professional levels, the Coffee Technicians Program consists of six modules, coffee machines, hydraulics, electrical, water, preventative maintenance, operations management, and coffee preparation. So you can learn more if you go to sea.coffee forward slash coffee tech. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, and check out the educational program for and around the technicians program at the SCA, go to sea.coffee slash forward, uh, forward slash coffee tech. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode two of Ask the Pro season two, season three. We're going to start with our morning coffee. Let's start with Brett Vormer. What are you drinking, Brett? Uh, Pete's Organic French Roast. Mr. Benedict. Uh, drinking an Americano from Wonder Coffee in Fort Collins, Colorado. I have been sick all week, so today I'm just drinking fresh H2O. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, I like that. Uh, Rachel? I've done some single origin Guatemalan this morning. Arno? Uh, I had a, yeah, I, I had a, a shot of the, um, our Brazil Parceros do Cafe, which is an exclusive lot we get uh, through one of our importers. And Matt? Yeah, I was a little under the willow yesterday too, so starting with some green tea this morning. I'm unfortunately drinking coffee that shall not be named. That was from the picture from yesterday because I was too lazy to actually drink coffee this morning. I will I admit so it. Feel that. I so feel that, Highland. I, I walked past that urn on my way into this room. I was like, oh, I can totally. Have... Nah, I'm not going to do it. Here's the problem is it actually tastes good. This, yeah, that's so... what really worries me. So, and, and I don't know which bag it is. Um, welcome to Ask the Pro Series, you guys. This is our third season. We are committed to presenting these episodes throughout the year. So give Fridays 8 o'clock AM for the Copy Tech Guild. We have a good um, setup this year. Standard disclaimer, this presentation is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this webcast are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any aspect of the Specialty Coffee Association or the companies the panelists may represent. And usually we start with a do not try this at home, but that's not good. That doesn't really apply with this one. So our panel today is Rachel Dickinson, after sales tech from support law, after sales tech support law Marzocco. Rachel, introduce yourself. Say hi. Uh, hi, my name is Rachel. I've been with La Marzocco for six years um, in my current role. Um, before that, uh, my entire coffee career was with Starbucks. And Arno Holsuch. For a chief coffee officer of Bellwether Coffee. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Arnold Holshue. I run the uh, coffee team and the technical services team at Bellwether Coffee. We're a, a manufacturer of um, electric ventless roasters. And Arno, sorry for but butchering your name. Um, and Brett Barmore, retail facilities partner at Beats Coffee and Tea. Hi, Brett Barmore. I uh, do all retail facilities, um, execute all work orders from specialty coffee equipment to the actual building itself for all locations outside of California, as well as all locations in Southern California. Yeah, you're a busy guy. And then for our panel, we have Kurt Benedict, Mark Roby, and Matt Martin, and Highland Joseph, myself from Espresso Partners, and we're gonna get started. So each one of our speakers started in specialty coffee as a barista, and then their careers progressed into operations. I've known most of these people for a long time. For today's episode, I've asked them to tell their story to go over what they've done to go from being a barista, why they chose to work in specialty coffee, what they've learned, what they haven't learned. Did they just do it as a job? Did they say, I wanna land in specialty coffee? So we're gonna start with Arno and talk about his experience in Bellwether. And then as we go through, we'll move on. If you have questions, feel free and put them up on the questions board with two specific speakers and we will ask them. But with that, Arno, let's get started with you. Great, thank you, Hyland. Um, yeah, I, I actually, uh, cut my teeth at Blue Bottle Coffee. I was a journalist and I wanted a job to make some pocket change. I, it was my fourth job when I took a job at Blue Bottle. Um, it was very early days there. I was like their fifth employee. 
And uh, I just liked it. I was like, oh, being a barista is really fun. And uh, pretty quickly, it eclipsed all the other weird jobs I was doing and became my career. And I just fell in love with being a barista. Um, I did that for a long time. And then the transition came when I began to realize that if you really cared about baristas and you really cared about coffee, I, I needed to start focusing on the other things that made coffee happen outside of just like preparing it uh, for customers. And um, so I transitioned over uh, at, at, to start a tech department, the in-house, I was the, the I sort of founded the in-house tech department at Blue Bottle. And I uh, went from there into operations management at that company. And then from that transitioned into an operations role, uh, initially a pure, a more pure operations role here at Bellwether. Um, I definitely landed in specialty coffee almost by chance. I think that if, you know, if I had loved knitting and I had worked at a yarn shop, that might've been my path. But as it happens, I really, really love coffee, always have. And I landed at a company that really wanted to support me and, and see me grow. Um, so those are those are kind of the things that brought me to it. Um, after I was in an operations role, uh, uh, first running at that tech department, I really loved it because um, you sort of peel back a layer and then you get to see how things work inside. And first you get to like, you satisfy your curiosity about that. And then, especially if you've been a frontline worker, right? Like as this episode is about, like from barista to tech, it gives you a great deal of empathy for the barista and you really realize what you can do to improve the lives of your teammates and their customers. Um, and that's really inspiring to me. And that's kind of been a light motif in, in my career. Now, Hila, I'm not sure what, what else am I supposed to talk about at this section? No, I mean, you got it. Um, the question I was going to ask, I mean, Bellwether seems to be really connected to the barista experience. Yes. That we've always discussed. Yes. Kind of walk through that because it's, it's a different innovation that you see from a company because how do you, how do you, being a barista and being operations, how have you designed that relationship? Yes, with, with yes. The barista. Yes, that's a really good question. So you know, we um, Bellwether is an interesting company. It's um, it really is this sort of like it's it's a combination of some things that you I think you don't frequently see in our particular slice of the industry, which I would say is like roasting equipment, right? Like the company was founded. It was founded by a guy named Ricardo Lopez, and he he reached out to me and um, Gabriel Boscana, who's still our green buyer, as some of his first uh, his first contacts to understand what the product should be. And every step of the way, uh, there were roasters in the room and and people who had been baristas in the room as we designed it. And so we knew that we wanted it to be in cafes, and we knew that in cafes the the number one cost line on your P and L is generally your labor bill. Um, I always joke that's that's not necessarily true in New York. They have the privilege of paying more in rent than labor sometimes. But um, for us, like we knew that we needed to tread lightly on that labor expense if it was going to work in a cafe. And that really got us thinking about how could we design this thing so that it would be not just possible for a barista to use it and use it without expending a lot of time that could be used like making you know making drinks and generating revenue. But how could it be um, fulfilling? I think for a barista to use. And I think uh, I, this is like a theme I'd like to actually sort of present today. Um, when you're in operations, it can seem very much like it's like where the real work gets done. It's like where, um, because you're moving things from place to place, or you're actually building things or you're actually buying things, right? Rather than maybe like counting dollars or, uh, or designing a logo. Um, I think that those things are actually just as important, but it feels like very satisfying, but actually, in operations, like you need to make sure that people understand the meaning of what they're doing if you're managing operations. And for if you're managing a cafe, that is like managing some operations. So we designed our device so that the barista would um, truly understand what they were doing, right? Like that they were roasting coffee there. So they see a, a temperature over time chart with rate of rise displayed, right? Um, everybody has a chance to use a profile that we've made here. Or, um, or to modify one of ours or to create their own profile. And that was really important to us that this fit into the barista's life. Right. No, one of the one of the themes you'll find with our speakers is Bellwether is very barista oriented. La Marzocco is very barista oriented. And 
peach mm -hmm. coffee and tea, uh, they kind of, historically speaking, you can go back and look at, they invented the, I mean, a lot of what barista culture is actually comes from peach coffee and tea in terms mm -hmm. of what they do. But at some point in time, and I think we've all had this story, you, you go, I have to move on. I loved being a barista, what was next? Was there a clarifying moment, like specifically where you said, I need, I love what I'm doing, I need to move on? Yeah, I, I would definitely say so. It wasn't that I, it wasn't that I was running away from being a barista. I would still contend that that may have been the most fun job. I, well, actually my job right now is more fun, okay. But up until now, that was the, maybe the most fun I ever had at work. Um, but it was really this feeling the clarifying moment for me was realizing that if I cared about baristas and I cared about customers, this wasn't my place of highest value, right? I needed to move on. If I if I really cared about coffee, I needed to move on and do things that other people weren't doing um, with the same consciousness. I, I don't know if this is, let me try and say it again, Highland, like the best. <laughs> I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, the best manager is somebody who has done the job that they are managing, right? Because it gives you this knowledge of what that work life is like and this knowledge of the challenges. And so I, I saw slowly, I was like, oh, we need somebody that's um, in an operations in an operations management role here who understands what it's like to be a barista. And that led us to very concrete things like we, uh, at the tech department back then, um, we would always endeavor to be back out of the cafe by like 6.50 a.m. so that the barista had a sporting chance to actually dial in and then serve their first customer with pride, right? But you know, if you've never done that job, that just seems like a really hard thing to do, a really early time to get up. But we had all been baristas, so we had that empathy. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a theme, Rachel, can you jump on? You're gonna be next, but it's a theme that we discuss here a lot is what makes a good tech? And one of the, Actually, kind of controversial question is, is so many service techs in the coffee industry don't know anything about being barista and don't know, don't know anything about making coffee. So it, it is yeah. something that we will we actually will discuss it here. So Arno, I'm going to ask you to log off. Great answers, thank you. And Rachel, I'm going to ask you to go. Hello, um, my journey uh, from barista to tech actually started before I became a barista. I was already doing uh, technical work in photo finishing and then in circuit board repair. Um, and on my way to the circuit board repair uh, job, I stopped off uh, every morning at a Starbucks coffee. And the manager there uh, basically uh, harassed me into getting a part-time job with Starbucks. So uh, that was my entry into specialty coffee. Um, and uh, it was part-time. So it gave me an opportunity to start learning coffee, uh, about coffee. Uh, and from there, I learned that there was a internal position within Starbucks uh, for a equipment technician. and uh, as soon as I learned about that, I started educating myself and self-motivating uh, to become a, a Starbucks tech. And after uh, about five years uh, of doing both jobs, I uh, was successful at that. Um, what I found most relevant about my journey from being a barista uh, to a technician, especially within Starbucks, is uh, it gave me an opportunity to really be able to integrate myself into the cafe setting uh, with Starbucks. Uh, so I wasn't just there as a as a tech who was in the way to fix something. Um, I was actually marking cups and preparing drinks and handing them as I was fixing the machine, uh, helping them do their job and actually serve their customers as well. Um, and uh, uh, that was a very successful uh, relationship. Um, 
and uh, the my experience there and, and connections within Starbucks because of the the relationship Starbucks uh, had with La Mazzocco, uh led me uh, to be able to uh, leave Starbucks and go into my current role with La Mazzocco. So two questions. Um, the first is La Marzocco is, um, tends to be very barista oriented. If I mean, in my experience, it tends to be a very, very barista oriented um, organization that they're, they're focused on the experience. Of music. What do you think as a barista, former barista, how do you think that benefit your, your experience benefits that when you're working on tech support? About half of the people who call in uh to after sales are baristas or cafe managers so being able to ask questions that are in their language um it, it really helps me communicate better and um uh, quickly be able to resolve issues that they're having um especially if um, what they're calling about ends up not being a, an equipment related issue, but more of a coffee, coffee preparation, or even uh, milk, milk issue. Yeah, I've, I've had that conversation. So the second question is, can you speak to the events that you organize? We've talked about this in the past that you organize for all Marzocco, just what they were about and, and, and the subject matter. Uh, I, uh, La Mazzocco, uh, for a couple of years, uh, sponsored an event called Let's Fix It, uh, that was specifically designed to, um, uh, address some disparity as far as getting more women involved, uh, in, in technical, uh, aspects, uh, but, uh, also uh, what was open to everybody and also very focused on baristas and those who are interested in technical aspects of their equipment. Um, just, just teaching them, uh, allowing them a free space where they could ask questions, get hands-on equipment uh, and, and be able to learn something uh, that at minimum uh, allowed them to be able to uh, have a better relationship with their coffee equipment and also be able to have uh, some empathy and understanding of what a technician is actually doing when they're coming into their cafes to repair equipment. How was your, how, I mean, what was like the, any key takeaways from that, anything you learned about Anything you see that you learned? <laughs> it's like, it seems like we've had events where it's been focused on baristas learning how to be tech. And I've always found them to be really powerful events because you really, baristas get very excited when they learn one cool thing on the machine. Was there anything that stood out to you where it's like, this is awesome? Being able to um, provide information that, uh, uh, me and my fellow participants in, in that uh, were very passionate about and uh, understanding that there is a hunger for uh, from baristas to learn more about their equipment and also become in a lot of ways a little more self-sufficient and uh, addressing issues as they come up and understanding how the coffee they're preparing uh, uh, can be uh, improved by having that extra knowledge of the machine. Okay, last question is for uh, on the um, disparate, disparity comment. Any recommendations to women who want to become service techs? We've kind of had this conversation back and forth. We have. And so um, that's and you can, you can actually you could actually pass because it's a very large question. It is. Uh, uh, I, I think it's more of uh, um, having those in the already in the industry being open 
to welcome everybody uh, into our fold and recognize that there are differences in experiences and, and rather than uh, uh, rather than not uh, kind of being a little off put by that to embrace that. That was perfect. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to Brett Barmore from Pete's Coffee and Tea. Brett, how are you? Um, so my journey to specialty coffee uh, was certainly completely by chance. Um, you know, wasn't wasn't looking for it, thinking about it in any way. Um, I spent, uh, you know, after college, had no idea what I wanted to do and had no idea what to do, and um, spent a couple years uh, owned a body piercing shop for a couple years. Spent a couple years as a uh, handyman and taking uh, day labor work as in, on construction stuff. Um, so spent some time there. Um, uh, spent some time as a couple of years as a case manager for child protective services and um, you know got more depressed than bored there but certainly time to move on um, and and just decided you know after that to move out to uh, San Francisco and uh, and I had some friends out there and and wanted to take my chances and had no idea if job or work or or any of it um, so uh, just started looking for a job doing absolutely anything just so I could make enough money to stay um, let alone and then kind of thought I'd figure out, okay, and then I'll figure out what I actually want to do and what I want to do out here. Um, and it, months went by and I still hadn't had a job and, and just happened to have a friend who was like, you know, why don't you go stop by here? They're having a hiring event over at this Pete's Coffee um, in, in Berkeley. And, and so I, I went over there and, and was hired that day on the spot and, and luckily, uh, you know, got to stay. Um, so uh, so started working as a barista um, and uh, very quickly um, became a shift lead as well. Um, and, and just was really loving it. Um, you know, I, I didn't even drink coffee at the time, um, wasn't into it at all, just again, needed the job. Um, and, you know, I was hired as an opener, so I'd be there at 4.30 in the morning and calibrating the machine and, uh, and uh, needing espresso shots very badly. So, uh, so very quickly, I, I developed a, a very strong addiction and love for, for espresso and for coffee in general, um, just because it's, uh, you know, just being around it, um, just really, uh, really seemed to bring me to life and, uh, and I was really enjoying what I was doing. Um, but obviously immediately being in a position of, you know, obviously I, I, I can't really, I was already a little older, can't really make the living wage that I want, have a, the goals that I really want just working as a barista. So I was looking, you know, how can I actually move on? Um, very quickly started working out of the home office and kind of helping out our customer service team. Um, so, uh, so even at that point, I wasn't really looking into specialty coffee as the way I was going. It was really more about um, you know, looking to how can I make a little bit more money and still kind of I'm, I'm enjoying this. So let's see what happens. And and in customer service, uh, you know, I kind of started splitting my time a little bit. And, and in customer service, you know, uh, with Pete's, they really do train you and spend a lot of time teaching you about coffee, teaching you about the history of Pete's, um, doing tastings, um, all of that. And uh, and they really kind of teach you um, how to love coffee and, and really what to look for in coffee. And uh, And I really at that point kind of started to fall in love with it. Um, and really thought, okay, you know what, I really, how, how can I stay in coffee? How, how can I make this continue? Um, so after spending about a year in customer service, which again, you know, wasn't, you know, was a little bit, you know, more attainable um, for some of the life goals, but at the same time, it just didn't make any sense as far as long-term. And um, I don't know how many, if anyone's ever worked in a call center, it sucks. Um, you're kind of chained to your desk um, constantly. And, and you know, it's, uh, it was great to talk about coffee a lot, but there's just kind of that part of it as well. Um, so it was really kind of looking um, in the company as far as what else I can do. Um, you know, it wasn't a large, you know, much smaller than it was today um, at the time. And uh, and just happened to be that uh, an opening came up on a very small team for facilities managers um, in Pete's Coffee. There's only three of them um, and they don't come up too often. I think my coworkers have been with Pete's for 26 years now and 15 years. Um, so, you know, certainly not a position they leave a lot. Um, so was able to, especially with my background in doing some handyman work and construction and stuff and uh, and was really a good fit uh, because as you know, beyond the coffee side of it, we obviously take care of the building side of it as well and all of that. So um, so it just kind of became my niche as far as how to find um, specialty coffee and, and really kind of stay in there and, and get a way to, to kind of be involved in it still and talk about it from that operation side. So what's, what's your day-to-day -day look like? You, may, you, you manage almost 100 stores. What's your day-to-day -day look like in terms of, and, and how, how does that, how often do you interact at the barista level? Um, so 
I mean, daily, uh, definitely yeah. daily interacting at the barista level. So, yeah. you know, in, in general, my day is, uh, you know, I mean, obviously having almost 100 stores, um, something is broken constantly, um, whether it be, you know, the espresso machine or the plumbing or the electrical or, or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, the, the best part is, you know, it, it's not the best, obviously, but, you know, my favorite part, of course, is when the coffee equipment is down because then I actually get to talk some with coffee. Um, so, uh, so I do talk with them daily um, because we do spend a lot of time talking with our stores about, um, you know, troubleshooting things that we've seen. Um, obviously, being in the stores is a huge, huge benefit. Um, all three of us that are in the department have all worked in stores um, and been baristas. Um, so, you know, we all kind of have that connection and really do know what these uh, baristas are going through and even the store managers are going through. And even when it's not the coffee being down, when it's, you know, power outages, when it's, you know, the plumbing being backed up, how do you, you know, how do you rinse your porta filters? How do you rinse your milk pitchers? Um, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, having experienced all of that being in the stores um, is certainly a huge benefit uh, because we can kind of talk them through that and, and kind of letting them know that you've been there before um, does help as well and, and kind of makes them feel better about it. And like, you know, we're going to get through this, uh, but it is a really task to talk to stores for sure. Yeah. So you guys, so I, you're one of the few organizations that really trusts the troubleshooting process to the store. Not a lot of stores do. How how has that worked out in terms of solving issues before you have to send it to to me to the service company? <laughs> um, uh, you know that's something that was certainly in place. I think you know that was just a matter of we had the right people. I think from the beginning, kind of build the program and what we wanted to do. And really, it was because of how slow um, I think Pete's came about and how slow the facilities department came about. Because really, it was you know, started in 1966, but was, you know, under 30 stores until, you know, the 90s or so. Um, so it was really a smaller organization that um, was really trying to be scrappy, I think, about making sure, you know, spending the money and all of that. Um, so they really did develop uh, some really good processes as far as troubleshooting, um, documentation, all of that. Um, and we also are given opportunities to go out in the field and run classes with baristas and take them through, this is what you do when it's clogged. Um, you know, this is what you do in this situation. This is how you can bypass your fill valve and still make coffee on your urn. Um, you know, so we kind of get to go out and do those things. Um, and so uh, we're very active in making sure that we talk to our stores and and basically just walk them through it and kind of hold their hand through it if we need to. Um, but in the long run, obviously, getting us up and running faster, um, as well as then obviously saving that money as well is huge. So from a facilities manager position, do you think there's a cost benefit to that? Um, there absolutely is. Uh, there absolutely is. I mean, you know, the, the the other side of it, right, is that you send it out to a company that's going to um, just kind of send somebody out every time. So you're always going to have a travel cost on every single little thing. You're always going to have that hour of minimum labor. Um, you know, you're always going to have that stuff that happens. And then you're also going to, you know, especially de dealing with a lot of things that aren't coffee too, you know, you deal with a lot of stuff in text that you don't trust and that you don't know necessarily. And and stuff that you don't know as much about, like, do I know a little bit about an HVAC system? Yes, but can I tell you for sure how to fix one? No. Um, uh, so certainly, I think uh, um, you know having that um, is in the long run saves a bunch of money because it also I know enough about the system to also look at an invoice and be like, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, take the time to review what when it was replaced last. Um, all of that it actually sends ends up saving thousands of dollars a year because you're actually somebody that really kind of going through with a fine tooth comb as far as like, wait a second, this shouldn't cost this much. This was already done. This should be warranty. Um, we, we catch a lot of things throughout the year. So last question for you. Um, as a facilities manager, you deal with a broad, spe broad spectrum of techs. Is there a specific trait or a specific set of traits that you look for when you're managing that relationship? Um, I mean, communication is the biggest one. Um, absolutely yeah. at the top. No, uh, <laughs> there's a, you know, we, uh, so in between my stores and region, I execute around, you know, four to 5,000 work orders a year. Um, uh, you know, some of those are, yes, very simple. Tech showed up and, you know, changed out a C1 assembly, unclogged a toilet and left. Um, others of them become months and months of work uh, that you have to put into it. Um, so. Uh, in order to manage that many, I really need to work with people that I can count on to update me with what's going on, to be updating my work orders with what's going on. Um, if I don't have that, um, then I'm going to be so buried that I'm never going to be able to be on top of it. Um, so yeah. communication is the number one thing that I look for in any any vendor. Thank you.
Um, can I get cameras on, please? We'll start with panelist questions and <clears throat> individual questions. So Brett, let's start with you. What do you find rewarding about the job? Why does your job rock? Um, I, you know, it, it's partly I found a way to stay in specialty coffee. I mean, I uh, I still get, you know, as, as much as I don't get to be involved in actually making drinks anymore, which I, I very much miss, um, you know, there is, um, there is something so joyful about being behind an espresso machine and, and delivering quality drinks to customers um, that uh, uh, it's, it's just a really fun experience. And especially if you're working with the right people, um, it can just be so great. So you do miss that a lot. Um, and, you know, you certainly miss that. But at the same time, you get other rewards because you're solving larger problems. Um, you know, you're, you're actually, you know, you're part of, you know, we also do project management rollouts for new equipment, um, SOP writing for new equipment and training. Um, you know, getting out there to actually train, like you just get to touch it in such a different way that overall really makes a difference, um, you know, I think to the whole organization rather than just that single customer you just served. Thank you. Arno, how about you? Okay, sorry about that. I was muted. Classic. <laughs> I've, had, I've had two years to figure this out now. Um, I think that there are two things for me, there are two things about it that are really satisfying. The first one is that I'm working on something that I really care about. Um, I mean, here at Bellwether, we're pretty explicit about the fact that we're trying to decarbonize roasting, and that matters a lot to me. Uh, I think it matters, like it, for me personally, it matters a lot to be able to work on something that is aligned with my values and what I think needs to happen in the world, right? In a way that is, uh, uh, that I think can be just like helpful, um, and we, we try very hard at Bellwether to be um, non-judgmental about what's happening in the world around us. We're really focused on the good that we might be able to do. So that's like incredibly satisfying. And that's something that I got more of as I started to work uh, uh, in operations and in management. Um, the other thing is that I get to, uh, me, and, me and my teams, I should say, we get to tackle really interesting, challenging tasks um, that are really diverse. Like to just name a couple of things, we've um, our technical services team has just completed its training program. I think uh, two or three months ago, we finally were, were like, okay, here's our our service partner training program, and we're able to go out now and actually apply training to technicians. Some of which have, by dint of necessity, have been fixing our machines for a couple of months now, right? And so they've you know they've learned through experience, which is I think how many people probably uh, in this in this realm have learned it but um it's very satisfying to be able to do it better <laughs> you know and to be able to actually put that together and as a new manufacturer i mean rachel you work at like uh my manufacturing hero so i, I always think like you guys have it all done um but to do it is uh, this wonderful like sort of feeling of pioneering um it, that's also just to say something that's nice about working at a startup there are many things about working at a startup that are uh, less pleasant um they tend to be very work intensive places to work but they they do give you a chance to explore and do new things and exercise your curiosity. Rachel, how about you? Uh, there are two things that, that come to mind with the question. And uh, one is uh, being a technician, uh, whether it's a support role on the phone or a technician in the field, uh, it's never boring. There's always something going on that engages your mind uh, and imagination uh, in the problem solving process. Um, and, and the other thing that I've spoke to before is uh, how many jobs do you get to have where you can on a daily basis be somebody's hero? Um, uh, the technician comes in and essentially saves the day. And uh, that's pretty self-satisfying to be able to provide that to people that's a really solid that's a really excellent point too brett what about you brett you're on mute sorry about that um uh as far as biggest challenges i face daily there's Biggest challenges. We're not. We, we're moving on. Oh, actually, hold on. Sorry, I, I I skipped protocol. Matt, Kurt, Mark, do you guys have anything to that? Add to that, or any questions for the for the group? 
Uh, not regarding that aspect. I did have a different one if Go you want me it. to hold off. Nope, ask away. Um, That's what we're here for. I actually want to ask about your backgrounds before you became even the barista. So how much do you feel that the previous backgrounds you had maybe technically helped encourage you to move to the tech side in the coffee industry? Let's start with Rachel. I, I started learning tech uh, in photo finishing uh, long before I got into specialty coffee and then I moved into uh, repairing circuit boards uh, before. So um, I was tinkering with the machine when I shouldn't have been as a barista and actually fixing it, including taking parts from the machine to my other job, fixing it and bringing it back. So I was I was doing a little things I shouldn't. So my my previous experience, I had a lot before I became a, a coffee tech. So my mine mine journey is a little bit different than a lot of people's. Arno, get off mute first. Arno, come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got off mute. It took me a second. Highlands, I still, I'm still getting there. Um, more coffee, dude. My, you're, near, you're near like 30 roasters. You need more coffee. I need much more coffee actually than I have in my system. Um, I had no technical experience. I will say. I, but the job that I had previous to being um, in the coffee industry was that I was a journalist. I was sort of an all-purpose journalist. I did short humor writing. I, uh, I did. I wrote in German for two years. I lived in Berlin for two years and wrote a short humor column for a newspaper there. I was. Uh, I did investigative journalism. I did spot whatever it took, right? And so I did, but I didn't turn bolts for a living at all. I um, I was really broke because I was a journalist. And so I had to work on my own car out of necessity in order to keep it running. And so I had a, like a, a 1992 Toyota Tercel and I remember it broke and I had no money. And so I like hitched a ride to a local junkyard and found that they had the transmission transaxle actually that I required and figured out how to get it to my house. And then I bought the Haynes manual and I swapped out my transmission and transaxle um, because I needed to go to work. It was not like some passion of mine, but having done it, I was like, wow, that was really great. And um, so I, I kind of, I, I was not a naturally mechanically inclined person. I, I wanna say to people out there who may be intimidated by that in themselves, that it is absolutely a learnable thing. Like I was not a, I, in, in high school, I didn't rebuild a Camaro, right? Like it was not nothing like that. Um, so, however, I will say about journalism, that journalism teaches you to adopt new fact sets really quickly. It teaches you to communicate well, obviously that's sort of your job. Um, and it, it you have to have a pretty rugged work ethic. And those things were absolutely necessary as I became a technician. So I didn't know, I never knew you were a journalist. So now I understand why you produce such good written content for the digital content team. Yes, it's my secret other, yeah. my other career yeah, that I, 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 just, I just admire your grammar because mine's terrible. Brett, how about you? Um, I, I think my history as, you know, I, I did work as a handyman for a little while and spent some time, you know, just picking up day jobs as I could with construction crews, mostly doing demolition and stuff like that. Um, it definitely helped lead me to to my current role as the facilities manager, right? Like I never was an actual, you know, coffee tech, anything like that. Yes, I probably played with the machine a bit more than I should have as well when I was working as a, a barista and, and did a few things that maybe didn't nobody ever told me about and just figured it out um, because I did have that history. And, you know, that was always fun to me. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it was really why then naturally when the facilities manager job came up and you do cover so many other areas, electrical, plumbing, things that I, I do have some experience in that, um, that it did kind of allow me to, to kind of keep that role. So it was definitely helpful to where I ended up and it made a big difference in impact. Sorry, my mute was that. No, that was my mute. <laughs> Actually, maybe I need some more coffee. It's about two days old. Um, let's go to biggest challenges you face daily. And Rachel, let's start with you. Well, coming out of a global pandemic, uh, the challenge, well, uh, the challenge we're currently having, along with everybody else, is supply chain issues. Um, 
uh, and, and being able to navigate that uh, reality uh, with everything opening up uh, and there being a really uh, huge need for uh, those supplies, uh, it's, that's really been the biggest challenge um, uh, other than um, uh, helping technicians who may not have been able to tackle a lot in the field kind of reconnect with their troubleshooting skills and their knowledge of our equipment. Right. how about you? You're on mute. <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, I challenge wise, I mean, I think the pandemic's definitely, you know, added to that. Uh, like Rachel said, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of changed, right? I mean, finding the time is always the biggest challenge, um, you know, with, with, with our job, um, I feel, because you have so many people you need to call and so many stores you need to talk to and so many vendors you need to talk to, but there's only so many business hours in the day. Um, so I think, uh, you know, our biggest challenge is kind of finding that time to communicate. When can I call the store and actually talk to somebody when they don't have a line all the way out the door? Um, because not only do I want to talk to them, I want them to troubleshoot something with me over the phone. Um, so okay. certainly that's always a challenge because we don't necessarily know where they're at in their day. Um, so kind of just finding the time to be able to actually contact everyone and reach everyone is, is definitely our, a, a big challenge on a daily basis for us. Thank you. Arno? I would, I mean, I would mirror what Rachel said. Supply chain is currently the biggest problem that we have. I think for equipment manufacturers, we're like living through this moment in history where every manufacturer in the world is abandoning just-in-time lean inventory at the same time and trying to stock up for safety because um, the pandemic really has changed the world economy in a way that I think most people who just are like living in the world and maybe consuming things haven't quite gotten yet. Things have really changed. There's a lot less, it's a lot less easy to get stuff out of China just to say that. Um, and uh, everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, you are getting stuff out of China that you use in your daily life. And if you haven't felt the impact yet, just wait, you will. So that's, a, that's one thing. I would also say though that like, uh, we've seen of late a real uh, bottleneck around tech availability because uh, we're, you know, again, we're going out there, we're opening new markets as a new manufacturer. We're like placing our first unit in some new geo in, or in some new city. We need to find a skilled technician there. And a lot of those technicians are way oversubscribed on their time right now because people are reopening their cafes and many of them maybe didn't decommission their equipment correctly or maybe they need everything to be gone through really well and you just cannot get the hours from the skilled technicians that you need so again if anybody out there is listening like we kind of need your help come you know the water's fine come on in yeah i mean i mean to speak to arno's to just to speak to what arno's saying is right now our industry our entire industry is hiring there's not a yes. tech company that i do not know of that could not use five techs that and it's 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 a it's a buyer's market because we're looking for really qualified techs. Um, before we go on to the next question, I'm going to open the floor to questions from our viewers. Um, you guys, we have a worldwide audience. We have Taiwan, Greece. We've got yeah, we get a really broad audience. We have about 22 people, um, but it's all over the world. Um, panelists, do you have any questions before we move on to the the last question? Matt, yeah. you look like you're out one. Okay, Matt, go for it. Yeah. So the, the transition from barista to anything beyond the barista um, perspective can be challenging at times. And even just trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B is, is a little bit of a head scratcher at times. And um, so what would be like one um, tip or one main thing that you would say to those people looking to get into the industry as to things to really focus on or things to really surround themselves with or uh, maybe even just something that would help them grow into that sort of role that they're looking at getting just beyond the barista you know behind the bar type of thing so what kind of advice would you share to those kind of people let's start with brett um you know i i think the biggest piece of advice i would say is uh yeah, it can be challenging to enter the operations side because there's so many baristas out there and so few operations jobs and you end up generally, you know, if things go along the lines that I've seen or with our company, you know, you have a lot of people that are applying for that job as well. So, um, you know, as bad as it might sound, I think a sound piece of advice is make sure you kiss some ass to some degree. 
Um, I mean, you know, got to be honest, right? Like you're going to get that job kind of based on recommendations of other people in the company, based on recommendations of who you know. I mean, you know, they're going to find out if you're a hard worker or not. Like that's, you know, they can talk to your coworkers, all of that. So um, it really is about you also need to make sure that you're personable to people and really use your connections. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help and ask for advice from people that are already in those roles that you know. Um, you know, I think that's really important is like, you know, just be willing to do that. Um, and and I think that they can kind of help you and hopefully give you that leg up to get in. And I'm having a new problem now too. Arno, how about you? I, I think my advice to people there would be to um, to take a moment, clear your mind, sort of ask yourself, what do you really want to do? And once you figure that out, like if you want to go into operations or you know if you want to become in the operation side of technical service then um, once you have that in mind like be patient pursue it um, because the first thing that happens when you step off the bar is that you lose your tips and that uh, at least for most people I know who've transitioned out of being a barista they experienced a big reduction in their take-home pay when they stepped away from the bar because uh, you don't get the cash and so that's going to be a second in the long run you will be made whole that's kind of one thing I want to say, like it, you're making an investment in your future when you step away from being a barista and step into any other position in a coffee organization, but it is totally worth it. Uh, it's just going to be painful for a little bit. You have to want it. You have to know that, it, that there's some sacrifice involved at first. That's not anybody's plan, by the way, like your company is going to be paying you more probably hourly than you used to get. It's the reduction in tips. And, and I think companies have a very hard time backfilling people's uh, income from tips. They just kind of can't do it and and be like and afford you. So you're gonna take it on the chin there for maybe six months or a year before, or maybe even longer before you're back to your income levels. Thank you, Arnold. Rachel. Uh, to add to that, self-education is gonna be your biggest asset to move from barista to a technician you have equipment in your cafe there are manuals available for that equipment specifically having to do with preventative maintenance if you start with preventative maintenance you form a deeper relationship with your equipment which then will bridge the gap into being able to pursue being a technician well rachel you win the gold star that was a great answer so i have a, uh, i have a side question is uh, did any of you have mentors someone during your tenure that you're like i'm i mean i had a mentor i got i had a couple i was lucky enough where i was like i was on a, for several of them i was on the phone like daily so you have a mentor and what 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 was really key about that relationship let's start with you rachel uh, with Starbucks, how they onboarded new technicians, I was given the luxury, uh, especially with super automatic equipment, it's modular. So I was able to, uh, in a shop environment, work on this piece of equipment with uh, my coworkers. So we, we had the time to go through uh, uh, equipment, the luxury which a lot of us don't have. Uh, and I, I spent time with these technicians before I went live. Uh, so I learned how to be able to integrate myself into a cafe setting and how to uh, repair things and start to build on my knowledge. And uh, more importantly than just learning the equipment is also starting to uh, they imparted in me a philosophy on field work and field technician and how to approach troubleshooting. Uh, uh, and uh, also, once I transitioned from the field to uh, telephone support, um, uh, call out to to Mike Sable, uh, a former coworker. He he really really helped me. Uh, gain a greater understanding of uh, uh, equipment and again that philosophy that goes into teching and troubleshooting and, and really helped me grow into uh, being able to provide the best uh, uh, support that I could for Lomazoka. 
Arnaud, how about you? Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I had um, I had a specific mentor. His name's Alex Roberts. Uh, he runs Roast Co. It's a coffee roasting company here in the Bay Area. And but at the time, uh, he was a technician, and um, he he totally taught me how to how to do this job. Um, he didn't really tell me necessarily every single technical skill that I needed, but he he did do the thing that I think, again, like I think is kind of a trope in our industry. He had an old beater uh, three group linea. And he was like, I tell you what, why don't you rebuild this? And I was like, well, how do I do that? And he was like, well, take it all apart first. So I took it all apart and then I soaked it in uh, a solution to, de to descale it. And then I shined everything up. And then I said, great, how do I put it back together? And he handed me like this sheaf of exploded parts diagrams. <laughs> and was like, I gotta go. <laughs> And uh, and actually though, like if he had sat there and showed me how to put it all together, it would have been much less helpful, because what he showed me was that like, listen, you can do this, right? And you will need you, in fact, as a technician, will need to have the mentality that I can learn how to do something that I don't know how to do. I can learn how to do it pretty quickly. Like, so you, you kind of like he taught me how to learn. And he also, I would I would echo what Rachel said about a philosophy. He he taught me this philosophy that was a a balance of um how can i put this a balance of like you know what you just need to you just need to fix it sometimes like just do it uh, with um a lot of caution and respect for other people's equipment and i think as technicians you do exist in a space where like you know if there's something that's wrong on a machine um you're gonna like sometimes you're gonna have to pull the boiler and that's a terrible thing right but if you have to pull the boiler just pull the boiler, man. Like, just get it out of there, right? And and don't dither about it. But at the same time, make sure you need to pull that boiler first, right? And and, uh, and sometimes you can't actually know. So you, you just gotta, you're gonna have to take action, right? So I, I, I give huge props to him. I'd also like to just um, mention Fortune, who's another uh, longtime Bellwether, or sorry, longtime Bay Area technician. Uh, his company's called Coffee Max. Um, Fortune was very, very helpful to me. He actually came in and helped me finish putting together that linea at one point in time. And he taught me all sorts of old school tricks of the trade, like polishing button fittings so that they might get a good seal again and, and you know, how to kind of get an old beat up machine uh, back up and running. And I got to say, so far as I know, that machine is still running in a cafe in San Francisco. That's awesome. Brett, how about you? Um, I wouldn't say I had a particular mentor um, per se, um, you know, coming up through it. I, you know, I, I really just had a lot of support uh, from, you know, everyone I needed it from, uh, I would say. So I kind of got it from everyone I needed to, from my coworkers to the leadership that I was involved with. Um, they did a really great job of the training that they did, as well as just whenever I did have those questions, um, as well as the people I worked with as well, like, like Highland, for example, um, you know, huge asset and benefit for me to be able to call when I was first starting off, um, you know, kind of trying to delve more into the equipment side of it. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was just a matter of utilizing the people around me um, and I had really good support in that. Thank you. Um, panelists, do you have any questions before we move on to the next question? Mark, Matt, Kurt? Okay, so I'm gonna do two more questions. Marty Rose asked a question, which I think is a good one. Um, Marty trains a lot of techs and he's asking for advice on what can we do to best meet the needs of anyone interested in training, any must do's to teach techs. The one I'm interested in is the must don'ts to teach, to teach people who want to come to techs. So Rachel, let's start with you. When approaching training a new person, the most important thing in my opinion is realizing that how we individually learn is gonna be different from our specific experience. And that's gonna include a knowledge base that we started off all the way back as kids into adulthood. It's gonna be different. So being able to acknowledge that and empathize that something is different is really bottom line important to starting to train a new technician. Thank you. Arno. Yeah, I would say that the, the, my number one don't is, um, well, there, it comes from a do, which is you do need to, to sort of give people a certain, um, my old boss used to call this an esprit du corps. Like you need to give people a certain pride in, in what they do in their profession when they're coming into being a technician. It's a hard job, right? It's a very stressful job. And so you wanna give people 
uh, put a little starch in their shirt and be like, yeah, you know, this is a, you're like one of the champions, you're one of the heroes, right? But the really important but and don't is don't let that slip into some sort of us versus them with other elements of this industry, specifically baristas. Because when a technician walks into a shop and takes down the machine to fix it, that is a bad moment in everybody's life in that cafe. And that barista has a lot of people looking at them that want their lattes, right? And you need to approach that situation with an intense amount of empathy, right? And really be on their team and be treating baristas as, uh, you need to approach the barista as an ally and make sure you're solving their problems. Um, the other thing I just, because I got to say this, is there is a specific technical skill that is very, very important. The one that I find is most frequently lacking out there, and that is a thorough understanding of electricity. Um, I would say that uh, understanding Ohm's law, just to say it, um, and not just memorizing it, but actually understanding sort of how that works, is the single most challenging thing that we find in working technicians at this company, at least. You notice that we all shook our heads really, really actively. I mean, that's the thing that we all see. Um, Brett, how about you? Uh, you know, I mean, having never been a tech or trained techs, uh, you know, I think it's a bit harder. I think, uh, I mean, I think Arno's response is right on as far as from my side of it, from right the operations side of it, right, is that, um, you know, we, you know, we very much understand that some of these baristas maybe didn't diagnose this right, or this is their fault that this is actually happening kind of thing, um, you know, with how they're treating the machine and what they're doing with it. Um, but certainly it's, it, it is, it's just a horrible moment for them, um, uh, you know, to have all those customers looking at you as well as I'm sure you guys feel it as text too. I mean, to have all these customers basically staring at you, fixing this machine, like wondering like, is this going to be done soon so I can get my drink and go um, kind of thing. Right. So, uh, so I think just, you know, patience uh, is, you know, and, and, and attitude are key, um, key things uh, when you're dealing in those moments, because it really does, uh, you know, make the store feel better about the experience, which then, they report that to us, everyone feels good about it, um, as well as, you know, they, they see that on the customer side of it too, and that matters to these stores that you're in there working for, right? Um, is, you know, that whole experience matters to those. So even if the store employee treated it right, but you have a really grumpy tech in there that's, you know, cursing or, you know, just making a lot of attitude, um, it's still gonna be a negative experience for the customer. Um, so, you know, ultimately it'll be a negative experience regardless of how well you fix the machine. Um, so certainly, I think attitude when you go into these um, scenarios, when when it is kind of that high stress environment, is key and huge to, to train. Thanks, Brett. We're, can I add one more thing there? Yeah, I we're think, gonna we're gonna go a little over. If you guys are okay with it, I'm fine with it. I'm I'm okay with it. I just want to really quickly talk, sort of go back in on, on this this sort of vein we're talking about with being with having empathy for the barista and for the customer. There's a thing that we used to do sometimes when I was running the tech department at Blue Bottle, which was we would come into a cafe, maybe one of our wholesale accounts, and actually crowd management we saw as maybe the most important thing we had to do there. And so we would get in line at the back of the line. And as the next person tried to get in line behind us, we would turn around and say, I am so sorry. I'm here to fix this machine. So if you want a latte, you're not going to be able to get that. And it's because of me, because I have to fix this machine. And that's a really good way to take some of that heat off of baristas. And it's just an example of like how important this um, service side and hospitality side of the job really is. That's that's a fantastic point, Arno, because I don't think I've ever seen a tech or I've ever had a tech company actually have crowd management as part of their training. And all of us who have been techs have all sat there and had that person staring at you going, can you make me a latte? So I'm gonna since we're going a little over, I'm gonna actually pose the don't the don't question to Matt, Mark, and Kurt. If we could keep it quick, I would I would like hey, to Highland, do that. I, I unfortunately have a hard stop. I know, so, Rachel. Thank you so much for thank coming. you for having me. I, I really I appreciate, appreciate it. And just FYI, you guys, Rachel will also be with us next week at Troubleshooting 101. Rachel, have a great weekend and thanks for your time. So you Kurt, guys, let's you, start with you. let's start with you on a don't. And we'll just we'll make this quick, guys. But I'm curious as what 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 they have to say. Uh, Kurt, Tyler, can you can repeat off? the question again? The question is: Marty asked for advice. What we can do to best meet the needs of anyone interested in training a tech? What are the must dos? But really, I think it's important. What are the must don'ts when you're developing a tech? Here's the biggest one. I always like to tell my guys is: don't get in the way of the barista if you can help it. Um, so I have a, a rule I always tell everyone too, because 
even with you taking the bar down, they still have to, the shop still has to operate somehow, whether it's, you know, cold brew, just cups of coffee, whatever. Um, so I always tell them, butter gut to the bar. I don't care which one it is, just stay out of their way. Butter gut to the bar. So that's my biggest one. Don't get in the way of the barista. Thanks, Kurt. How about you, Mark? Uh, so, I mean, obviously, interaction with the barista, that's all very important. Customer service, I think, as you know, is for me 50% of tech work. But I guess my biggest takeaway on that is the don't is that I, I do have techs a lot of times that'll go in and, and perhaps the equipment's older and and perhaps there's a part that is suspect <clears throat> and it might be a point of if you touch it it's going to fall apart and so one of the key things that we always pick up as you know make sure that wherever you're going to tackle something you have a backup plan in other words let's not take apart let's not, let's not take a piece of this apart that perhaps maybe a, a fitting is corroded and and may have you know been rotting and 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 completely uh uh, you know, uh, disassemble on you and not have any kind of recovery plan. So we've taken a machine from, you know, somewhat working to now we've completely broken it and we don't have the part, you know, so it's, it's really kind of look at everything in the beginning, see what you have to tackle, you know, start with a plan first. And then, you know, from that plan, we'll figure out how to do it instead of, you know, just going in and tackling something without, you know, perhaps having the part or, uh, or the ability to, to make the repair once you've, already done the damage. Thank you. Matt, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to approach that from two different perspectives. From the trainer, his training techs, don't assume that everybody has the same learning style. Don't uh, assume that everybody's going to learn exactly the same way. When you go into training technicians, you have to understand that some people might just um, be Arno, who's tearing stuff apart and putting it back together, and that's how they they learn. Some people might, uh, you know, visually uh, be able to watch something and gather that, or even just uh, read something and gather it that way too. And I think just like your approach as the trainer side of things has to be vastly different so that every person is successful where they are. Um, and as uh, you know, the the new tech that's walking in the stores as to what not to do, don't assume that your job is more important than theirs. I think the reality is is that they are the customer. You know, they're the people that are actually paying you to be there. And, you know, if you go in with an open mind, kind of like what everyone else has already stated, like um, if you take care of the customer first, and that is their customers as well. So, uh, you know, the shop that you're going into, but also their customers, like there is, a, you have a higher responsibility to not just take care of your immediate customers, but their customers as well. Um, so I think if you go in with that mindset, um, so now I think that you're more important than anyone else on the floor. I think you'll be successful. Thank you. So we're going to wrap it up and with one last question, and then we'll do the close. Um, and I'll give you an example. Is years and years ago, one of my mentors gave me a piece of advice, and to this day, I constantly um, uh, source back to it for a lot of different reasons. Um, his advice to me was less certainty, more inquiry. And what it really taught me at the time, and I was very young, so it was a very powerful piece of advice, because I was also incredibly cocksure when I was young. And I kept going back to it, and it's like, do I know enough about the question I'm about to answer? Do I know enough about what I'm about to do? Because like you guys, I got to work with Tim O'Connor from Pacific Espresso, and his literally his first training for me was, he put a swift motor in my hand, put the diagram in my hand and said, change its motor. Now, at the time, I didn't know what a solenoid was. And it took me eight hours to change a swift motor, but I walked away from it, learned knowing how to do it and actually understanding a lot of really basic stuff. So, and I'm gonna ask all five of you this, as, as you've gone through your careers, is there any one piece of advice where you go back and you're like, you, you look back at it and it helps you move forward, if that makes sense. Brett, let's start with you. Oh, you had to start with me, huh? Um, okay, let's start with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 really, it was the, uh, I mean, you know, uh, the best advice I got was, uh, you know, really, what do you got to lose? It doesn't work, uh, you know, get get in there and, you know, figure it out. I mean, that's that's usually the been my strategy uh, throughout my whole career is, you know, you can, 
you can get educated and learn, but every problem is unique. Um, you know, there's no textbook that's going to tell you everything. And so, so really just get in there and, and, you know, do the work and figure it out on your own, um, you know, as much as you can. And I think that's the best way to learn kind of like, you know, dropping a transmission in your car, never having done it. I mean, the book's not going to walk you through that. You just got to really get in there and do it. Thank you, Mark. Matt, how about you? Sorry, I was going through all sorts of channels of things in my head to say, and then I lost <laughs> the question. So would you mind repeating it one more time? So what's what's the single best piece of advice you've ever gotten that helps you move forward? Mm, yeah, actually, I think this is one of the things I was processing through. There was an article that was written, and I don't even know who it was by. Um, and I think it actually had to deal something with Cough Technician Go, uh, somebody who wrote the content, but it was talking about humility and uh, how oh. humility actually do you know who wrote that me it was you okay yeah. so don't get too big of a head here be humble <laughs> <my one. laughs> i i i i i think that any anything any service job you guys anything we do as a barista and i learned this a long time ago partially because i was a cocksure dick is that to really <laughs> you really need to bring sorry for saying that but you really need to bring a sense of humility to all the work that you do it makes you a much stronger person it makes you a much stronger worker so you finish up there, Matt, and thank you. My head's getting real big right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely true. Like, I remember so many times where, I don't know why it happens this way, but, like, you feel so confident that you know everything in the world. Like, you've seen everything that you possibly could see, and then you get to that one thing, and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing right now. And I think <laughs> if you in with humility and understanding that you're always going to be learning, uh, you're always going to be growing, and if you uh, approach, you know, your job with that in any way, shape, or form, like I, I think that gives you a big leg up on your ability to learn and take in information and accept feedback and grow. So. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate the answer. Kurt, your turn. Um, the best advice I ever got was from who I kind of considered my mentor when I was actually in the photo industry when I was building uh, digital photo printers. But it was my boss at the time would always tell me and remind me, the only bad question is the question you didn't ask. So he always That's reminded great me. Yeah, he always drove it home. If you have a question, don't be afraid to ask it. Someone, If someone gets grumpy with you about you asking that question, find a different person. Just find someone that is willing to help you. And there's always gonna be someone that will help. Mm, that's about best thing I can say right now. No, that's good. Thank you, Kurt. Arno? I, I'm going to say something I think might make some people angry. Uh, th this is a, a piece of advice that specifically applies to your first year in the field. Okay. After that, you shouldn't, <laughs> you should not rely on this advice. It but my advice is not, yeah, yeah, yeah. When in doubt, swap it out. When you're starting out as a technician, okay, I, this is why I think some people will disagree with this because it's not actually the right thing to do. The actual right thing to do is figure out exactly what's going wrong and to fix that exact problem. But when you're starting out, that's challenging to do. You may not have the full toolkit that an experienced technician does mentally, the full toolkit. And that coffee shop has to get back up and running. And actually, what matters is not that you do the precise, correct thing on the machine. What matters is that that coffee shop can make coffee again. You can always take the part home, disassemble it, and find out exactly what went wrong there. But um, when you're stuck, uh, if you can at least identify the component that has failed uh, or the set of components that has failed, the assembly that has failed, get it out, get out of that shop, make them happy, take care of it after the fact. Um, because when you're in there, there's so much adrenaline in your system. It's going to be very challenging for you to like really learn a new technical skill um, if it's a complex one right there, right? So an example of this would be like steam valves. Right. If you have a steam valve that's not working, swap out the steam valve. I don't know why it's not working. You can figure that out later. They're very easy to swap out. Do not remove the steam valve, disassemble it, clean it, put on new O-rings, reassemble it, and put it back in the machine, unless you know that you can do that in five minutes. Right. In that case, totally do it. And you'll be able to do it in five minutes in, in, in time. Anyway. Arno, that was actually great advice. And as someone who manages a lot of field techs, although you probably did tussle a bunch of people. I've actually done it with field techs, like just change the part. 
let's just get moving and then let me know if it works. I should have done that to Brett though, because I work with Brett, but <laughs> Brett, what do you got, my man? Um, you know, as I think about it, I think as far as, you know, best single piece of advice I've ever gotten that's kind of shaped, you know, me or who I am and, and that I kind of turn to is uh, in something like a subject that we somewhat touched on earlier is, is just to, um, and essentially the statement was just to, to approach everything with empathy. Um, because it really does um, make a difference, um, you know, and it's something that I learned when, you know, I was, I was, when I was with Child Protective Services, right, you're in some really difficult, ugly, horrible situations um, with people that frankly would probably, you know, anger the old me to the point of of wanting to be violent. Um, but, you know, a much different role then, and you really do need to look at, like, what the reality is for these people, um, you know, like, what, you know, what's really going on with this person, is it beyond what they're actually um, and I think it just has really made me a calmer person in general um, to take a moment in those situations. Anytime I have that stressful moment or that I'm angry or, or feeling like that, um, I do try to take a moment and kind of try to look at it from um, kind of what this other person might be going through. Um, and it really does change um, how I interact with people and how I react to people um, in, in situations that um, especially that are stressful or where they're trying to bring anger. Um, it's a huge difference in who I am as a person. Thank you, Brett. That was all of you guys. That was all really great advice. So we're going to wrap it up here. Next week's episode is Troubleshooting 101. Kurt, Mark, Matt, and Rachel will be doing an unusual thing. We'll be doing a short presentation on teaching you how to troubleshoot, not specific equipment, but theory of troubleshooting, and teach your techs to be good troubleshooters, and take questions from our, our, our viewers on how to best train your techs. Um, with that, we're going to close up. Brett, Arno, thank you so much for being panelists and imparting your information. It was incredibly valuable. And I really appreciate it. Thank hey, Highland. Hey, sir. Hey, I got one more question. Okay, go. Hey, Brett, the hair. How long does it take to get that hair? <laughs> the I've hair is I've been waiting an hour to ask you this. I, the I, hair is I, amazing. I actually requested that he put full hawk up, by the way. I did. <laughs> You know, it's uh, it actually only takes about 15 minutes to get up or so. Um, it's 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 not too bad. I, I keep it, you know, it's a it's a shorter length that I've had it at times. Um, so you know, it's a little bit more manageable. But um, you know, something that I've I've done on and off since I was a kid, literally. <laughs> I had an old buddy who had hair like that, and he used shaving cream. What do you use to keep it up? Oh, I mean, now you can use just simple products from the store, right? They have the Pre's hairspray and all of this. When I was, you know, in high school and stuff, you know, we had the old, you know going to the old punk rock shows, right? You have those old recipes of like egg whites and sugar and like literally you kind of <laughs> stick it up and then you don't actually take a shower for a week or two because you pull your bed out to the middle of the room and lay sideways so that your hair can stay up because it takes so much to get it out and to get it up. Now it's no. just, you know, 15 minutes, I can get it up and down, whatever. <laughs> yeah, when I was when I was in punk culture back in the 80s, I had, I had like Billy Idol, big six inch tall hair. I would use egg whites and gelatin. And one time I mistakenly used blue gelatin and put it in there, not thinking at all. And then I went to a Dead Kennedy show at the at the Mabuhay and I was like, everybody thought it was the cool thing ever. And I was like, wait a second. I was like, I was so embarrassed because it was like this electric blue and I was somewhere where I couldn't do anything about it. But the problem was like, when you did that, if somebody punched you or you got in the mosh pit, your hair would just snap off. Like you see a big chunk of your hair just flying across the room. Okay, now, now for your hair care tips for tax. Okay, guys, <laughs> gentlemen, that was an awesome conversation. Thank you. Hopefully, um, you'll join us next week for troubleshooting. Um, I appreciate your input and have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Take care.